Good morning, Charlotte. Good morning, Rabbi. Did you have a good time in your vacation? Uh, yeah, short, but really uh, quite uh, wonderful. Good, good. You need a little change. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and of we course, it's about to get crazy, but that's, you know, such is life. How are you doing? Pretty good. The dermatologist and I have been keeping company, but that should be my biggest worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But as long as he's his job or her job, that's her the job. It's a lady. All right. As long as she's doing her job, that's what I uh, yeah. care about. This Deuteronomy is a repeat of everything from the prior books um there are many many sections that are repeated but uh the repetition there's there's a lot of new material and not all the repetitions are exact repetitions um deuteronomy is a very unique and different book um we call it deuteronomus the second law because it does repeat a lot of the laws that we have seen uh earlier in the torah but very, very different emphasis. So for example, it draws a lot on the laws in Exodus that come after the Ten, the Ten Commandments and the laws that follow in Exodus. Uh, it really doesn't draw so much upon the uh, ritual laws of Leviticus. I mean, it does. I mean, it also has the holidays, but a very, very different focus. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, you know, it's, what's interesting is if it's supposed to be a repetition, why isn't it a repetition? You know, what's what's different? What are the unique perspectives of this book? Hmm. Just. And, uh... Anybody else here but me? At the moment, no. I know Susie's not going to be here. Um, she's uh, with her daughter. And um, uh, Shell, I believe, is still away. So we'll see uh, who else uh, makes it. Oh, goodness. It's not even noon yet, so I. Uh... My uh, clock says it is twelve noon. Oh, yep, and here comes Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Rabbi. How are you How are doing? You? Okay. Don't mind me. I'm just a little bit of work here. When did you get back from wherever you went to? Um, we uh, we got back more or less uh, Sunday night, really Monday morning. Um, we were out in, uh, we went to see my brother-in-law and sister-in-law in Chicago. They are um, building a uh, summer home uh, on Lake Michigan. Oh, and nice. So we went out on Friday, we drove out there. Um, the house isn't done, but it's coming along and looking beautiful. So we slept on mattresses on the floor um which was fine we had running water we had uh, <laughs> and uh so it's really camping. not pardon me urban camping yes urban camping um yeah. not um, the, was, <laughs> yeah. the uh the um the kitchen was fully functional and uh so we were there came back sunday morning unfortunately Allison wasn't feeling well, but after numerous tests, she absolutely does not have COVID. She feels oh great now. God. She's fine. 
good so, good um the the only hiccup uh well that was a big hiccup but the only other hiccup um was uh the plane that was supposed to leave at uh, 6 50 on sunday evening left at 10 30. Oh, so uh when you translate that into east coast time we got in about 2 2 15. so and we were just zonked on monday just totally useless I can imagine yeah yeah you know but now thank god no i mean allison is feeling great um the girls just finished at camp. Uh, they're on the way to um, they're on the way home from Ottawa, and uh, Noah's being dropped off at school because she's already got stuff to do for Hillel and just <laughs> okay. who knows what else. And uh, Alisa will be home with us for the weekend, and then Sunday she goes up to school. So good. Yeah. Okay. So, how's everybody doing? Uh, Hashem. Yeah, good. Good. Okay, let me start sharing the screen. Um, all right. Really don't need at the moment. Okay. Uh, that's one, but I need the other one. Yeah, here we go. Sorry, it's just going to take me a little while to uh, size the windows appropriately. And... Yeah. Oh, I've got some workmen here, so I may be going in and out because they're doing their thing. <laughs> Okay, there we go. So I thought, um, even though there are just so many things to discuss in this week's Torah portion, uh, but I thought we'd look at the second paragraph of the Shema, um, since it appears in this week's parasha, and uh, kind of compare and contrast with uh, what uh, we read last week in uh, the first paragraph of the Shema, because obviously there are clear similarities and, you know, discuss what the, what is similar, what is different, why may that be, and understand what's going on. I, I want to share, uh, in particular, the work of my uh, teacher, uh, Ruvain Kimmelman, um, happened to study some of this stuff with him uh, a couple of months ago as part of a, uh, a rabbinical assembly uh, study session, um, although he's been working on this for a little while and the work he did for the Torah.com actually came out a few years ago. But even so, there are just some interesting things in looking at the end. Since it's a paragraph that we recite uh, fairly frequently, it's worthwhile to, uh, to understand it in a little detail. Okay, so I'm using, um, there was also a, uh, a section, a, a production in. Um, the Torah.com by uh, one of its directors, uh, Professor Mark Brettler, who I knew at Brandeis and unfortunately never had the chance to really take a class with him, but I've been to a few lectures. He's just an outstanding, outstanding uh, scholar and teacher. Um, and he did a whole thing on the Shema's second paragraph. And he begins uh, by noting the similarities between the first paragraph and the second paragraph. As he says here, the following chart highlights the overlap between these units. It includes the verses. Uh, sorry, I just have to move everybody again so I can see. Um, it includes the verses in chapter 11 that contain significant similarities to chapter six. This overlap is so significant that the Tosefta can imagine a person reciting the paragraphs of the Shema prayer from memory and getting confused between the first and second paragraphs. And frankly, um, speaking from personal experience, yes, <laughs> that can happen. Um, and in fact, here's the uh, section from the Tosefta, uh, the opening parts of Brachot, the uh, first tractate of the Mishnah and the Tosefta, 
of course, deal with prayer, and in particular, the Shema and the Amidah. And uh, the Tosefta reads, HaKoreh Shema V'ta'a, uh, one who's reading the Shema and makes a mistake. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't know where he made the mistake, um, he should go back to the beginning. Um, if he erred in the middle of a paragraph, um, he goes back to the beginning of that section, the beginning of that paragraph. Um, and if he erred in the confuse the first mention of the words and you shall write with the second mention of and you shall write i.e. skipping between the first paragraph to the second one um you should return to the first mention you know sometimes i find all the laws what you do if you make a mistake in your tefillot they're so complicated you know if i can remember all of those laws then i probably wouldn't have made a mistake in the first place but you know but Again, so we know it's rather similar, the two sections. So I'll look, uh, first of all, at the right-hand side, the first paragraph, and then take a look at the parallel sections in the second half. And then we'll go into the similarities, differences, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, oh, Ricky's here. Hi, Ricky. I think she's here. Yep, she's here. Okay. So, um, as uh, I, th I think a lot of these words are going to be rather familiar. <laughs> so, in the first paragraph, uh, the first, yeah, the first paragraph of the Shema, and you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Um, very similar. Uh, to uh, the beginning of the second paragraph. And if you hearken to uh, my commandments, that I'm commanding you today, to love God, Adonai your God, and to uh, serve him, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul. And of course, we also have uh, continuing in the first paragraph, and these words, that I'm commanding you today, they should be on your heart. So right off the bat, what's similar, what's different in, in these two sections? What's different so is that in the Deuteronomy 6.5, it addresses a singular person, and in eleven thirteen, it seems to be plural, right? Correct. So um, we will see that mostly in well, yes, in uh, the first paragraph, it's addressed to people directly, um, but for the most part, it's going to be in the plural in uh, the second. Excellent. Anything else? Well, the word aldecha isn't used in the second paragraph. Right, yeah. So, um, or it is used in Malach and Bet, so I'm not sure exactly what to make out of that. Yeah, well, in Malach and Bet, they're kind of like quoting this. So it's, um, but we'll, we'll come back um, because the whole ma'odecha is a weird word um, because ma'od in the overwhelming examples in the Torah, Tanakh, mean is an adverb, very. So, um, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your very, <laughs> with all your much. We'll come back to that. Okay. So, a change in person. Uh, one word is missing. Um, and I should point out what, what, what is the same. Uh, the emphasis on uh, loving God, which love in Deuteronomy often means loyalty, um, but the emphasis on the heart and the soul, or the being, and uh, especially the emphasis on the heart, 
but that appears in two sentences in the first paragraph. Okay, good. Going on, some things that we know very well, the shinantam, and I'm again on the left-hand side, the shinantam levanecha, and you shall teach your children, the dibartabam, you shall speak of them, when you lie, when you sit down, when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, and when you're rising up. And uh, in a similar and going on, you shall find them as a sign upon your hand, and they will be totafot, uh, we'll translate it as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall inscribe them on uh, your mezuzot uh, of your house, that, which we now understand as the uh, walls, um, which we also saw actually back in uh, Shmot, where the blood was placed uh, on the mezuzot, on the doorposts, and also on the mashkov. And the parallel sections uh, in this week's parasha, in the second paragraph, the sum tem et varai ela alavavchem fi al nafshechem, and you shall place uh, my, my these words on your hearts and on your souls. And again, all this is plural, as you pointed out, Ricky. Ukshartem uh, otam liot al yedchem, and you shall find them for a sign upon your hands, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach your children uh, the bare bums, speaking of them. And again, and once again, and if I may in, interject uh, back in the first paragraph on the beginning of verse 7, uh, my teacher, the late Stanley Gewurz, uh, suggested that uh, the root is shin nun nun rather than shin nun hey. Uh, and he understood that to mean incise it from shane. Hmm. From two. Well, we're gonna, that's a great point. To them. <laughs> but um, it still isn't that much different than we might have no, no, The basic idea is similar. It's, it's, it's you, you know, you can say it's a little bit of a twist, but it's not really all that different. You're sometimes you're, you know, you're incisive and sometimes you're just teaching stam. I wouldn't make too much out of that. No, well, no. except that I'm it is that. different. And um, we'll come back to that word as well. Is that, you know, and again, what, what is the root of the word? What does it mean? Um, overall, the differences are not major differences and they don't really change what the thrust of this message is. On the other hand, there are some differences and some similarities. And, you know, how, how do we understand some of that? Um, so, uh, and here is just, uh, the, uh, the English translation of what we just read. Now, um, Brettler also tries to point out the similarities, which many of which we've already seen, but some deserve a notice. Um, he says here, the blocks of material are mostly in the same order and some of the repeated materials atypical suggesting that this is not a case where common stereotypical language is being repeated in two unrelated passages. So I, this last point is what's crucial is that some of the similarities are unusual to these two pieces, to uh, the first paragraph of the Shema and the second one. He points you're, you're out- peculiar to those two pieces. Pardon me? You mean peculiar to those two? Pieces. Yeah, peculiar to those. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure what you were saying. I got you now. Okay. So first of all, that um, only these two passages use kesher, make sure to bind with the word ot, sign. Um, the difficult word totafot, which we will come back to, which the new JPS renders symbol, is used only one other time in the Bible. 
Um, and these expressions, when you stay at home and are away, is found only in these two contexts. Uh, and also, also unique to these. Um, and 6, 9, and eleven twenty. those two verses are identical, except the one minor difference in uh, the spelling, and contain the concept of writing these things on doorposts and gates, which is found nowhere else in the Bible. Okay, let me help. help. Yeah. So that, uh, so the similarities between these two sections are peculiar. <laughs> you know, it's it's not that there's a great distinction between these different parts. Um, again, the message is clear, but the similarities are unusual. Um, and then, of course, there are a couple of things, and we've pointed out that one, is absent in our in chapter 11, in our section. Um, and uh, as Rabbi Zucker pointed out, uh, the first paragraph uses vishinantem, and the second one is vlimadatem. And the elements are ordered differently in the two units. So uh, Brettler's... Uh, Assumption here is these differences suggest that the two passages are not by the same author. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these unusual words. First of all, the unusual word totafot. You have to take a look at some of the traditional mafarshim and see, you know, how do they deal with these unusual words? Um, uh, Rashi, uh, would somebody like to read? I can, Rabbi. Okay, thank you, Ricky. And they shall be for frontlets between your eyes. These are the tefillin that are placed upon the head. It is in reference to the number of the scriptural sections contained in them that they are termed chotapot. For tetet denotes two. In katbi and pas, in mm -hmm. afriki, denotes two. So, so yeah. yeah. So does everybody get what he's saying? He's making a four out of two twos. Right, and exactly. Referring to two other languages, what so one sounds like Coptic and the yeah. other one sounds like some other African language. But, you know, we're Rabbi Akiba knows this from is utterly beyond me. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, 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 it sounds like, uh, you know, what you call, what's the word, you know, the Doha in other words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Rashi's, um, and of course, we understand these verses as referring to the tefillin. It's not 100% certain that they did refer to what we know as tefillin. So to say that, uh, oh, well, this, the word comes, or two twos, because we have four sections in the tefillin. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ibn Ezra. Um, has, uh, and I, he doesn't really say where it's from, but he knows where, uh, it's not from, or he knows who to disagree with. It becomes a polemic. Uh, so I'll go on, Ricky. And they should be for frontlets. The word totafo, frontlets, is not found elsewhere in scripture. Yeah, the, um, but actual, uh, did I write it down? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the actual Hebrew is this word has no companion in scripture. <laughs> it's not found elsewhere in scripture. Okay, go on. Those who dispute the rabbinic tradition say that it is related to the Chatef mm -hmm. and preach toward the south. Yeah, it's a phrase from Ezekiel. This is impossible for the root of khatef is nun, tet, tet. However, this is lacking nun and there are two, two tets. Yeah. So basically what he's referring to is, I guess, the Karaites rejected the rabbinic interpretation and they tried to uh, teach this other one. And Ibn Ezra, the grammarian, is saying uh, uh, that doesn't work. Sorry. Um, but now we get to what the meaning is. This is from Tige's uh, comment. Ar Aramaic totefta renders armband and turban in targ. 
Targum, that means the oh. Aramaic translation. Targum Yonatan. Uh, that to Samuel, one ten, Ezekiel, whatever. Yeah. The uh, Tanaic texts. Yeah, the yes. early rabbinic te teachings. The early the period from the period of the Mishnah, the Tanaim, the later rabbinic scholars are Amoraim. So uh, Tanaic texts. So it means you know from the time of the Mishnah. Mention a woman's headdress called Tateke. Explains in the Gemara as a frontlet or something which encompasses her head from year to year. Um, these usages are compatible with an etymology deriving totepe, earlier totepe, originally toftepe, from the root tuf, yeah. known from Arabic, latauf, in circle or encompass. The spelling of the final syllable of totapo within without a vav in almost all biblical manuscripts indicate that it must originally have been intended as a singular noun, like the Talmudic totepe, the Tanaic totepe. Yeah. So basically, um, he is uh, in some ways defending. Uh, the translation frontlets. Um, uh, Weinfeld also uh, uses that translation. And Tige had written an article, which I read and don't remember because it was like 30 years ago, um, on uh, Totafot. So, uh, Rabbi Pavi, it's sort of hard not to think of frontlets because it says, you know, right. in other words, if it didn't say that, you would have that. You know, you, it's a question of, you know, it, it's, it has a great deal to do with a place that they're telling you to locate. Exactly. So that's that's the obvious. <laughs> and, and that's 100% correct. So, the whole meodecha. Yeah, that it's not there in um, our section is not necessarily so unusual. Kimmelman says, uh, the specific linkage of lave and nefesh with tefillin likely explains the absence of ma'od in our section, despite its association with them in the first paragraph. I'm not quite sure why, but that's his comment. But anyway, um, the fact that the word ma'odecha was a little odd um, we see in how it's explained later on. First of all, to take a look at uh, early uh, first century, well, no, it's not, these aren't so early, but uh, some first century Jewish texts in some way, um, when who quote the Bible, <laughs> the New Testament. So, um, you know, here in Mark, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So clearly they're struggling with the translation of that on some level. And then Matthew, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And as well in Luke, he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So they're, he's, they're adding the section here with all your mind um, and also with all your strength, that they would all be similar is perfectly normal because these are the three synoptic gospels that tell kind of the same story. So uh, they have a lot of traditions that draw on one another are very, very similar. But, you know, the fact that they add here with all your mind and two of them add with all your strength, they're trying to deal with this unusual usage. And uh, the classic rabbinic interpretation, actually in the, the Mishnah, but I'm taking it from the, the Talmud here. Ricky, why don't you read this one as well? And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. It was taught in the Brita. Rabbi Eliezer says, if it is stated with all your soul, why does it state with all your might? Conversely, if it's stated with all your might, why does it state with all your soul? Rather, this means that if one's body is dearer to him than his property, therefore it is stated with all your soul. One must give his soul in sanctification of God. And if one's money is dearer to him than his body, therefore it is stated 
with all your might, with all your assets. Rabbi Akiva says, with all your soul means even if God takes your soul. Yeah, so basically, modacha became to be understood as one's uh, money, one's uh, finances. But um, they all point to the fact that there is a little bit of a... Uh... That's not quite as far-fetched as it might seem. Because no. Because <laughs> um, it doesn't really mean your soul. I mean, that's a much later interpretation right. of what the Hebrew means. Nafshacha means your, you know, your the appetite, thing. your desires, you know, but essentially it means, you know, your neck, which essentially means your desires, right. you know, what, so, so as a practical matter, what's being said, you should love God with all your heart, with all your desire, and all your money would really follow pretty well mm -hmm. on that word. Even with Yoshio, would it be that far-fetched because Yoshio donates a good deal of his own money to the temple, as did many of the Davidic kings. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and starting with King David himself, who's donating towards the construction project. But either way, you know, it, it wouldn't really be, then at least each word would have a connotation of, of its own and the package would be very impressive. Yeah. With all your heart, with all your desire, and with all your, you know, with, with, all, your, with all your means. That yeah. would be the way of saying it. With all your means, you know. So they don't really work out very well. In other words, I think that, that don't get me wrong, Drush out that you're quoting a classic and absolutely I was brought up on that, you know, but 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 sometimes you just want to figure out what what could the shot possibly be. Yeah, and, and they're not necessarily uh, you know, I, I'm bringing these texts mostly to show that you know Odechas is an odd word, um, or at least an odd use of the word. And that uh, already Jewish interpreters were struggling with how do we understand that? But I, I think the uh, the Talmud's understanding is 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 quite reasonable. It's it's hardly far fetched or crazy. Um, you're I, I think you're one hundred percent correct. And now again, just dealing with this difference between Vishinan Tem Levanecha in one place in the first paragraph of the Shema. And you shall teach them uh, to your children. In the second one, uh, somebody want to go on with Rashi? Or if you want to, Ricky, you can go on. Okay. Or unless, Carol, do you want to? Or Charlotte? Anybody? Um, this is the language. Is that the one you want? Um, yeah. No, and you shall teach them diligently. Yes. Yeah, this is the language right. of sharply impressed, that they should be impressed in your mouth so that if a person asks you anything concerning them, you will not need to stammer, hesitate about it, but tell him immediately. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not crazy about the translation. This is the language of sharply impressed. Chidud means sharpening. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily mean sharply impressed, but that's the implication. And Ibn Ezra actually uh, a very similar interpretation. And you shall teach them from Shanun sharp in and a sharp arrow. The method of sharpening an arrow is well known. Yeah, which is, of course, you, uh, you know, rub it against uh, something else again and again and again to sharpen it. Well, you know, teaching and teaching again and again, but both of them pick up on the fact um, that we're talking about sharpening something. Um, and then uh, here is Weinfeld's commentary. Inculcate them, Hebrew, the Henan Tom, the PL form. The I, I must have made a. Uh, the the, uh, the the lexicographers that I have in accordance actually go with the first interpretation mm -hmm. Rabbi Zuku quoted, that Shanan is Roman numeral two here, and it's just the Y form of Shinun Hey, Shinun Hey. And in other words, they divide this Shinun into two meanings, one to sharpen and one to repeat. Yeah, well, let's see what, really? uh, well, let's go Let's go on with one. again and again. Yeah. The cow of the PL form of the verb Snun occurs. That would be shinnunun. Shinnunun. 
the cloud means to sharpen. And here, perhaps the meaning is to teach sharply, diligently, to impress upon. Yeah, so the PL well, form of a verb um, is generally, generally, not always, but can be a more intense form of a verb than um, the call uh, form. So uh, best example, lishbor means to break. Lishaber, which is the PL, lishbor is call. Lishbor is to break. Lishaber is to shatter. So he's just, uh, he's connecting with uh, Shin Nun Nun and uh, distinguishing, go on. Ehrlich rejects this derivation, comparing instead Arabic sunan, sunnah, way of life, rule of conduct. But the Arabic sunnah derives from the root, uh, what was that? That, that, would, uh, that would be like sin nun nun. Sin -nun, -nun. Cognate with Hebrew sin -nun, nun the semantic range of which includes sharpen, as well as institute, establish, prescribe, a custom. Targum in Onkelos Onkel and Neophyte. Those and are the, the our two very famous Aramaic translations. Oh, and the Peshitis translate translate with the tin. That's actually tuf, uh, sorry, taf nun yud. Uh, that is to rehearse, teach, which influences the translation of Aquila. Deuterosius. Yeah, so yeah, you know, these are all, these, all these things. Yeah, they're what all these things? ancient translations. Basically, Weinfeld is arguing that the root is in fact shin nun nun, um, and comes from the word sharpen, as uh, Ibn Ezra and Rashi suggest. He rejects the idea of uh, connecting it to the Arabic, um, but even if you do. The semantic range is kind of the same. And in fact, when we move to Aramaic, Unclos and Neophyte being Aramaic translations, Pshita being um, the Syriac translation, which is kind of Aramaic in Arabic letters, um, they translate it with tuf, tuf nun yud, which in Hebrew is shin nun yud, uh, hey. Um, and that means to repeat, hence the word Mishnah, or even the word we saw before, Tana, to, means to teach. Okay, Yehudi? Um, I just noticed that uh, the, the Dictionary of Classical Hebrew brings down a verse from Ben Sura, which is really perfect for our purposes hmm. here. It's Ben Sura chapter 42, verse 15, and I'll send it around after class. But what it says is, it certainly sounds like, I, and the next version of it says, remember there's more than one manuscript of Ben Sura, yeah. and, and sometimes the differences are, 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 are really of some substance because there was never what you call a, uh, what's the word, a, uh, oh, what can I remember the word for it? It was, a text that everyone- Authoritative text. Yeah, there's another word, but I just, I, I lost it. But either way, and I, I, in other words, if if the Vensira text, which actually uses Shin Nun Nun in a sense of learning, then it clearly has nothing to do with arrows. And I think we have to drop that. I understand why Abraham and Ezra would have done that because he doesn't know of any other use of Shin Nun Nun. And since Shin Nun Nun is used in Tanakh elsewhere, almost invariably with either Chitzim or Cherev or Nachash, you know, it's, it's sort of hard not to think of that that's what the Kavanah is here. But, you know, given, remember, none of them have been Syria in front of them. So right. as a practical matter, that's the point here. You know, if you have that, then that, then you don't even need to bother with the Arabic and everything else. That's like having it in the Tanakh itself for all practical purposes. Yeah, I mean, Ben Sira being written just after the biblical period um, and also would be very, very early. Uh, you know, that would be, a, that's a great example of, you know, how this is being used. Um, but, you know, it's still a difference between the two. Um, and what Brettler would argue is that later texts 
have a tendency to try and make an earlier text easier to understand. They, they rarely try and make something more complex. So um, Brettler's argument in his article is that, um, basically he's saying that the second paragraph of the, the Shema that we're reading uh, this week is already a midrash, already a commentary on the first. And uh, he believes the first section is an earlier text and you know, he points out these unusual usages that kind of get changed. I mean, Modecha gets dropped, et Epenechem instead of Vishinantem, um, using a more common phrase. Uh, they just point to the fact that this was probably copied by a later scribe uh, to make it a little bit uh, more simple. Okay, so now I want to turn to, um, excuse me, I got to move everybody around the screen a bit here. Um, I want to turn to, uh, uh, sorry, wrong button. I didn't mean that. Um, here I am. Yes. Uh, I, I just find uh, Professor Kimmelman's interpretation of this to be um, very, very interesting. Uh, in trying to say what are the ideas that are being conveyed here. And I think he would agree, and I know that he and uh, Professor Bettler, Brettler were definitely in uh, contact about this. Uh, one, because Brettler is one of the editors for the Torah.com, um, and they were colleagues at Brandeis. Uh, and um, so he would probably also say it's a commentary, but what's so nice about uh, Kimmelman's is that he's really, you know, taking a look at the ideas and putting it in context uh, that fits in very well with the context here in Devarim, but also in the context of Jewish ideas in the Tanakh. Um, so, uh, you know, he points out again, the emphasis on uh, Lev and uh, Nefesh, um, and it is important, uh, Yehudi made this before, we've mentioned it before as well, that nefesh in the Bible doesn't mean soul. In later Hebrew, it does. But nefesh really, you know, it's generally translated as like a, a nefesh chaya as a living being. Um, I heard a lecture uh, at Brandeis, actually, moderated by Professor Brettler with uh, uh, Everett Fox talking about his translations and saying that, you know, nefesh was very difficult because it doesn't mean soul. It really means kind of, as uh, Yudi said, like the throat and the breathing apparatus and, you know, like that 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 part of the body. The neck. The neck. Know, this Professor Holtz insisted on this when I was taking his course in uh, Hoshea and Yumio. But the, in the Tanakh, it's used so many times to basically mean to fill up, like, in other words, no matter how much you put in your mouth, you're never going to really be able to satiate yourself. So I, it actually would be a very nice triple header if you read it that way. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that the waters will reach you ad nafesh, you know, really up until your throat. Up until your throat. But you that's know. also. I'm ad nafesh. Yeah. Now, um, so as he points out here, um, we might as well read it. I mean, I, I, I couldn't do justice to Professor Kimmelman's. Um, so I didn't try and summarize it. <laughs> I really, even though I studied it with him or... I mean, he taught us, it was a Zoom uh, class. Um, you know, I, I think it, it, it's, it's better to use his words. And, he, you know, he mentions uh, the second paragraph announces its link with the first paragraph already in its first verse. And we saw the similarities to them. Um, and then he points out, but the overall framing of the paragraphs is quite different. In addition to other adjustments, the second paragraph adds the service of Adonai and subtracts the reference to a person's ma'od. La'avad na'ilo hechem ula'avdo, and to serve him, to, um, and it just says, la'avad chem not me'odecha, 
Um, the first paragraph begins with the imperative, you shall love Adonai your God, whereas the second paragraph refers to loving God descriptively as part of what seems to be a condition. If you obey, if then you obey the commandments that I joined upon you. In other words, the paragraph is about the Israelites keeping the commandments, which is in itself an expression of loving God. So um, here's it gets to, first of all, a very good question. Um, uh, Charlotte, you want to continue here under a conditional sentence? What is the relationship between the opening verse, if you obey the commandments, and the next piece? Then I shall, I or he will grant the rain for your land and season, the early rain and the late. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and oil. And I, or he, or you, will yeah. also provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and thus you shall eat your fill. So normally, we connect the opening verse um, with what follows a few verses later, as he goes on to say. Many read this as the standard conditional sentence. If you obey the commandments, then I shall grant rain and provide grass. So, and yeah, 14, verses 14 to 15. 15 would be aimed at inducing obedience. But this reading is belied by the next part of the passage. Lack yeah. of standard negative clause. By fo um, following the assurance of rain upon performance of commandments, the text moves on to describe what happens if Israel does not perform the commandments. Mm -hmm. Take heed not to be lured away to serve other gods and bow to them. For Hashem's anger will flare up against you, and he will shut up the eyes, the skies, so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its produce. And you will soon be lost from the good land that Hashem is assigning to you. Okay, so now he points out, you know, we always read this as kind of this condition, v'hayayim shemua, if you, uh, but then he points out that, go on. This is not a standard negative clause, however, which would be, if you do not do this, then I will not provide X, or then I will punish with Y. For example, Deuteronomy 28, which is totally dedicated to the consequences of obedience and disobedience, begins with, if you obey, and then turns to, but if you do not obey. Yeah, so if, you know, this is a standard um, conditional sentence, it doesn't follow the normal structure. But it so, does. Because, but it does, Rabbi Papi. He's picking out an example. It's like, you know, I could just as well pick out plenty of examples where you start up with something, a positive statement, and then he, Shamer, introduces a negative statement right. in Safer Devarim. In other words, you know, if he wants to, he, the, 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 what he's picking out is not representative of the way the safer operates. It's the other way around. He Shamir is much more likely than Baha'i'ah in low Tishma'u. I mean, we have a couple of those. We have that in chapter 8 and 28. But, you know, I, it, it, he can't go around saying that because this is one particular format that excludes an interpretation that otherwise would be, is the one you would basically choose. Yeah, except that, as he, well, let's go on and see, you know, I think he's, um, he's very sensitive in general um, to rhetoric. You know, what is the style of speaking? What are the techniques that are being used by the author? And he, I don't always agree with him. I'll, I'll say that at the outset. On the other hand, um, I think he challenges us to really think about, you know, how is something being phrased? And, you know, we, we generally read certain lines in certain ways, and, and for very good reason. But sometimes we may have to think a little bit differently. So uh, go on, Charlotte. Let's see what he has Since to say Since the here. text is not following the pattern, if you do good, then X. And if you do bad, then Y. I suggest that we do not translate the opening clause in 13A as the protestus, for example, the conditional if clause, 
of a condition and verses 14 to 15 as the apodosis. For example, the then clause. Yeah, so Rather normally we read it as if and then, but he's suggesting, no, let's look at it a little bit differently but rather the entire complex of verses 13 to 15 is the protasis, while verse 16 is the apodosis. What do these words mean, Rabbi? Yeah, as he says, protasis is the conditional if clause. Like when you say, um, if you follow my commandments, I will bless mm -hmm. you with rain. Um, the apodosis oh. is the then clause, um, or sorry, if you follow my commandments, the apodesis would be the um, the then. So then okay. I will bless you. Yeah. Or if you do not, then I will curse you or something like that. Uh -huh. okay. So verses fifth, 13 to 15, apodosis. Were you to heed my commandments that I enjoin upon you this day, and were I to provide rain for your land and season, verse 16, protestus, then take heed not to be lured away to serve other gods. In this reading, the wow, wow, that should be vav. I mean, it means vav. vav? vav. Talking about begins, the letter vav. Okay, that begins verse seventeen should be understood as otherwise, not for yielding the following overall conception: If you heed my commandments and I provide rain and crops, take heed not to worship other gods. Otherwise, Hashem's anger will flash up, flare up, and the bounty will cease, and you will lose the land. Yeah, so what he's suggesting, in other words, is that it's not just, if you heed my commandments, um, then I will bless you with uh, rain and crops, or I won't. Um, but he's reading it a little differently if you heed my commandments and I provide you with rain and crops, then don't turn to other gods. Don't um, ignore what I have done for you. Which, frankly, fits in very well with the message of Deuteronomy, which is don't follow other gods. <laughs> Worship God exclusively. Follow God's commandments. Don't turn aside. So, um, again, I, I would agree. I'm not 100% sure he's correct. But... I'm sending you a search of Hishamer. It turns out that the, close to half of all the uses in a whole Tanakh are just in Sefer Torah and Malone. Yeah, that, that, that and, and it's clearly used as, as, a, as a negative to a previous command. In other words, you know, it, it, all I'm saying is that you can't prove this argument on the basis of the turn of phrase. That's all. No. It's a very um, common turn of phrase in, in say, for the borough. Yeah. But it is kind of interesting that if Hishamer is the then, well, you know, it's like Hishamer. You'd be careful not to do X, Y, and Z, which certainly, uh, you know, uh, turning to other gods is a, a real uh, concern. So, um he makes another, another unique use of this in, in Sefer Devarim is the fact that it was always used to start a verse, whereas elsewhere it could be in the middle of a verse. So it's, it's clearly the, you know, it, the, the, it is the, ap, whatever the hell you pronounce that. Apodesis. <laughs> yeah, I know. When they start using these words, it's like, uh, even though I love grammar, I don't always remember all of this, this stuff. Um, so, you know, here's where he's coming into his argument. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the second try. paragraph of Shema is worried about the effects of affluence on the loyalty of the people, both because material success leads to arrogance and thus rebellion against God. And it, and it inspires the worship of fertility gods who were believed by many in the ancient Near East. Uh, That's what A.N.E., ancient Near East. Ancient Near East, including the Canaanites, to be the cause of agricultural fecundity. These concerns appear in other places in Deuteronomy. Yeah, so what he's doing is he's, again, not reading it this simply as, you know, if you do good, I'll, I'll reward you. If you do bad, I'll punish you. 
um, and putting into a larger context of, you know, what this is concerned about is what is your allegiance to God that you want to remember that God is the source of your blessing and not these other gods. Um, and sometimes when people become, you know, are doing well, eh, they're going to forget God. This is something that comes again and again in Tanakh. As he points out here, you know, at the end of Sefer Devarim, very famous section, um, uh, somebody, uh, Carol, do you want to go on? You're muted. You're still muted, Carol. I think she's muted because she's got uh, somebody. Oh, else. okay. All right. So, Charlotte, go ahead. So, Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat and gross and coarse. He forsook the God who made him and spurned the rock of his support. They incensed him with alien things, vexed him with abominations. They sacrificed to demons, no gods, gods they had never known new ones who came but lately, who stirred not your father's fears, who you neglected the rock that begot you, forgot the God who brought you for, forth. Yeah, so Yeshurun is another name for Israel. And uh, basically, you know- they Israel, only, only after it straightened out its act, Rabbi Papi. Pardon me? It's only after we got our act completely straightened out that we got to be called Yeshurun. Up to that point, we were Yaakov crooked. Then we got to be Israel, right. which half and half. And eventually, we at the end of the Torah, we finally become sure. Yeah. Um, but again, it's the sense that, you know, when you become, you know, so, uh, you know, as I say, fat and gross, um, you know, you turn to uh, other sources that uh, this affluence leads to uh, idolatry. Um, and here going going on. Deuteronomy highlights the linkage between affluence and the abandonment of God by repeating in three different places that eating one's fill can lead to forgetting God. And here they are. Immediately following the first paragraph of Shema, the text continues. When Hashem, your God, brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to assign to you great and flourishing cities that you did not build, houses full of all good things that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant and you eat your fill. Take heed that you do not forget Hashem who freed you from the land of Egypt, lest Hashem your God grow angry at you and wipe you off the face of the land. This unit terms the take that uses the term take heed and the expression and you shall eat your fill, both of which appear in the second paragraph of Shema. Yeah, here's an example of, you know, you can see it bolded in the Hebrew of Achalta Vesavata, you shall eat and be satisfied. He shamer lecha, uh, take heed. Mm -hmm. um, and then he brings out as well, very similar um, in Deuteronomy 8. Uh, and then, uh, and again, Deuteronomy 8 is still, you know, within our complex, within our parasha, but also, hey, hey. Oh, I'm sorry, pardon me, go ahead, oh, wait a second, hey. uh, but, but we're going to go down here to uh, Deuteronomy 31. Oh. This same constellation of concepts appear in Deuteronomy 30, 20. When I bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey that I promised on oath to their fathers, and they eat their fill and grow fat and turn to other gods and serve them, spurning me and breaking my covenant. All these sources make the same point as our section, namely that affluence can lead to apostasy. Also, I should point out, because we're not talking about Birkat Mazon, but the uh, verse uh, that is seen as the basis for Birkat Mazon is in our parasha. Ve'achalta v'savata uve'rachta et Adonai lohacha. You shall eat, and when you've eaten your fill, you shall eat and be satisfied. You shall bless the Lord your God. But you can see that this is uh, a phrase that's used throughout Devarim. You know, like, you know, when when you are satisfied, don't forget God. Don't forget where all this came from. Mm -hmm. um, and again, what I what I like about uh, 
Professor I think a Cohen. better word for thereafter there would be to thank. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, and a good deal of the time in Tanakh, that's what it means. Yeah. Just like okay. When I mm-hmm. say, even today, if I say Baruch Hashem, what I'm really saying is thank God. Mm-hmm. Although uh, my teacher, um, uh, Ruvain Hammer, Allah love shalom, you know, and someone would say, you know, how are you doing? You know, Mashlam Cha. He said, oh, Baruch Hashem. Said, that's right. Yeah, except that, uh, you know, I want to know how you're doing. I wasn't asking for a bracha. <laughs> how are you doing? You know? Okay. So, so many times in Tanakh, when someone says Baruch Hashem, what they mean is thank God. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The theological threat of material excess engaged also the prophets Hosea, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. Hosea threw out links, say, 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 Satiety. Satiety. They, I never knew that word. I uh, it's it's not <laughs> somehow. It's not a word that I think we use very often very in conversation. Not at all. To satiate. Yeah. Yeah. No. Satiety. No, we, we can recognize the word, but I don't know how to say it. it. You know, the it's verb we're familiar with. The now we don't use very really much. Right. Satiety with apostasy. He cites God's complaint that Israel did not consider. If it was I who bestowed on her the new grain and wine and oil, I who lavished silver on her and gold that they use for Baal. For yes. all. The references to grain, wine, and oil re- reappear in that order in our section. The mention of silver and gold matches that of the aforementioned Deuteronomy 8.13. Okay, so, you know, very similar in Hosea. He brings in examples from Ezekiel, and he brings in as well um, an example from Isaiah. Um, uh, So uh, go down here, Hosea and Ezekiel. Hosea and Ezekiel approximate the first part of the remedy in our passage, namely the withholding from Israel of the element that led them astray. Without these material assets, Israel will have little to inspire them to thank their new false gods. So uh, he's really, um, uh, but let's, uh, yeah, go, go on with Isaiah's approach. Isaiah's approach differs, however. His remedy is to insist on Israel complying with the divine command. command. Once the idols of gold and silver are cast away, God can safely go ahead and provide the affluence, engendering rain without fear of its idolatrous seductiveness. This approach is similar to what we find in the next part of our passage, but with a twist. Yeah, so you're just emphasizing uh, Deuteronomy's educational solution. Go ahead. Instead of just saying, as Isaiah, this is the road, follow it. Our section of Deuteronomy provides an educational stratagem through a series of positive measures aimed at binding Israel to God. In addition to loving God with which, with which both passages open, both include some practical measures and here we return to where the two par- passages are parallel. Okay, so again, it's going to be an emphasis on education and as well, um the uh symbols that uh are uh being used i mean there's certainly much more to this um let's just quickly uh finish up this section we already noted that the second paragraph of shema adds verses 14 to 17 which have no parallel in the first paragraph and which seek to maintain the loyalty to god through a framework of inducements and dis, dis incentives. But even the parallel sections are reworked in the second paragraph in subtle ways. Most significant is the way that the second paragraph reorders the elements it adapts from the first. The first and last remain constant. The middle two are transposed. Perhaps the starkest shift in this section is the way that 1119b, when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you get up. Although a verbatim citation of the first paragraph, even retaining the singular form through the accompanying, though the accompanying verbs are in the plural. Okay, before just, you go for just, um, you know, uh, to Ricky, to the point you made before, is that, you know, here's kind of an example where 
the second paragraph, though mostly in the second person plural, you know, the scribe is probably just copying, <laughs> you know, the section he had earlier. So he, you know, keeps it in the uh, second person. Anyway, he adjusts, uh, go ahead. Adjusts the meaning of the phrase based on its new context. In the first paragraph, this verse on constant engagement applies to you. In the second paragraph, it applies to your children. The command is to get them to do as you did in the first paragraph. Yeah, so he talks about how the importance of educating children. Um, I, I, there, there's a lot more here, but um, I think it's uh, a very interesting reading. And like I said, I think it connects very well with an, the overall thrust of Devarim, of uh, remembering what God did for you and not uh, getting swayed by suddenly when you're all set and you're all comfortable, don't forget God. And then, of course, the, uh, the resolution or the answer to all of this is, in fact, through education. Uh, and the importance of education, that is something that comes through again and again and again in Sefer Devarim, um, uh, later sections, he, he talks about Proverbs, uh, and indeed, uh, there are, uh, Weinfeld uh, talks about how Deuteronomy uses uh, the wisdom tradition. So um, just in looking at the second paragraph, it to combine Brettler and Kimmelman, that first of all, there are you know, obviously, uh, uh, there's a clear relationship between the first paragraph, the Shema, and the second. Um, and the second is probably coming as a commentary on the first. And uh, in Kimmelman's rhetorical reading, you know, he connects it with ideas that are very, very clearly part and central to Devarim, and as well found uh, throughout uh, the Tanakh. So, uh, you know, just uh, like I said, there's a lot more, but at least to get a sense of uh, when we read this paragraph that there's so much more, because so often, you know, it's presented as, oh, yes, this is kind of standard biblical theology that if you follow God's commandments, you'll be blessed, and if you don't, you'll be zapped. Um, but that's not at all. <laughs> that may be one simplistic reading of uh, the second paragraph, but it hardly really captures the depth of uh, what may be going on and the relationship between these two sections. So I, uh, I hope it gives a little insight into the uh, second paragraph of the Shema, whether you have to agree with everything that Kilman or Brettler says, that's, you know, that's not necessary, but... And I should say there's there, there's so much else um, in uh, Tigay's commentary. He also has a whole discursus on Tefillin and uh, Mizuzot, and you know there's just so much in this parasha. But uh, this is what I you know just because I just studied it with Kimmelman, it was fresh on my mind. Mm -hmm. So I wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Kochach, Rabbi Pap. Mamash. Yeah. And uh, remember those who are coming to services tonight, we have the dinner first at six on the beach, on the beach, followed by uh, services. Um, come early because we've got a nice crowd. Uh, and uh, what can I say? Once again, have a good Shabbos. Nice to see everybody again. Amen. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, now I can get there.